Luke 4, verse 15, the Bible reads, And He taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And He came to Nazareth, where He had been brought up. And as His custom was, He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto Him the book of the prophet Isaiah, which is Isaiah. And when He had opened the book, He found the place where it was written. Look at this verse. This is the key verse tonight. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fasted on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this Scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bare him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Let's pray. Lord God, thank You for the opportunity to gather together and sing unto You, Lord, and to preach Your Word. Lord, I pray that You would be glorified here tonight and You alone. Lord, I pray that You would just bring the Scriptures to life. Lord, I pray You would fill me with Your Holy Spirit and help me to say the things that You want to be said. Lord, and help me to not say the things that I should not say, Lord. But I pray that You would help me to encourage the people in Your church here, Lord. And I pray that You would help us to heal the brokenhearted. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There in Luke chapter 4, verse number 18, that's the key verse. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the Gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. The title of my sermon tonight is To Heal the Brokenhearted. The Bible is giving us some instructions here how to heal the brokenhearted. And we're going to look at this phrase more in depth. But first, I want to define a few of the other words just in this verse. First of all, when he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me. Now, anointed is talking about God's Holy Spirit. We see this used uh, in Acts chapter 10 of Jesus, how, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil and God was with him. So he's saying that God the Father gave God the Son the Holy Spirit so that He could preach with power. So that He could heal all of them that were oppressed. Listen, if you're a Christian and you're here tonight, I want you to know God has given you of His Holy Spirit. You are anointed of God to be able to help heal the brokenhearted. To be able to heal those that are hurting by the damage of the world and the devil and just those that are downtrodden. God has given you His Holy Spirit so that we can uplift people, so we can encourage people, so we can build up other Christians and yeah, even, even your worldly co-workers or people that are not saved. God's anointing of the Holy Spirit is upon us as it was on Jesus so that we may have power and that we can help, help heal those that are oppressed. In that same chapter in Acts 10, it says, And He commanded us to preach unto the people. Jesus turned right around and commanded people, now you go preach. right? Go ye into all the world and preach the Gospel. Why? Because He said all power was given unto Him. Now that He was given power, He gives that power to us through the Holy Spirit. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You keep your finger here in Luke. We're going to be back and forth here in Luke chapter 4. But turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 John 2 he says, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie. What's he saying? The Holy Spirit was given to you so that He can lead you into truth. You have no need that any man teach you. Now listen, it's very important. The Holy Spirit is your guide to understanding the Bible. 
That is your guide to understanding the Word of God. And, you know, today you have a lot of false Christians, fake Christians, the, the Pentecostal crowd that would say, Ooh, I'm led by the Spirit and I feel good by the Spirit. But if they never open the Word of God, they don't know the will of God. That's right. If they never read the Scriptures, perhaps they're being led by a false spirit, their own spirit. Yeah. Right? So we need to make sure that we are being led by the truth that comes from the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that helps us to understand the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is there to help us to learn the Bible so that we can be a blessing to others. So that we understand the Scriptures and then we can make an application and teach others also. Again, He said, He hath anointed me to preach the Gospel to the poor. To preach the Gospel to to the poor. So what is the gospel? Why are we given the Holy Spirit? Well, it's to glorify God. Understand that first. And how do we glorify God? Well, there's many ways. But preaching the gospel is one of the primary ways that we can use the power of the Holy Spirit to expound the scriptures. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Find verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. What is our standing with God? Well, it's the Gospel. It's that we have believed the Gospel. Now, the Gospel simply means good tidings or good news. You know, the bad news is you deserve hell. I don't care how great of a person you are, you deserve the judgment of God, which is righteous. It's fire and brimstone forever and ever. They have no rest day nor night. The good news, the good tidings, the gospel is that Jesus died for your sins. He wants to save you. And that is what we stand in. Look at the next verse, verse number two. By which also ye are saved. Notice, you know, the new the new Bible versions like to take that phrase are saved and turn it into are being saved. You know, like one day maybe you'll figure it out. Just keep on working real hard. No, here it says are saved. When you trust on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches you are saved forever. Eternal security is a phrase you don't find in the Bible where once saved, always saved. But just the concept of everlasting life. How long does that last for? If it doesn't last forever, it's not everlasting life. That should be a no-brainer. So he says, by which also, so it's the gospel here, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed In vain. Now the pastor's talking about his friend Stephen. That he needs to keep in memory what was preached unto him. He now understands the gospel. And if Stephen believes in vain, if he says, well, you know what, I'll I'll give Jesus a try for a month. I'll just, I'll see how it works and I'll go back to whatever I'm believing, you know, before. Well, that's believing in vain. Vain is selfish. It's hollow. It's empty. It's pointless. You know, it's like a balloon. It looks like there's something there, but it's just full of air. Right? So, but to believe in vain, there are people that claim to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They claim to be Christians, but they don't believe it in their heart. They're saying it with their mouth, but the Bible says their heart is far from them. Right? That's true faith. Look at verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So this is how Paul was saved. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. How did he get saved? Well, if if Paul deserved hell and you deserve hell, and it says here, Christ died for our sins. Now the wages of sin is death. Right? We deserve to die. But not just die physically. The Bible teaches a second death. Right? Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. What do I deserve for my sin for breaking God's law? I deserve to die and go to hell forever now here he says jesus died for our sins look at the next verse verse number four and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures not only did jesus die acts chapter two it says he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of christ that his soul was not left in hell neither his flesh did see corruption Now, and most people don't always connect these dots, but if I deserve to die and go to hell for my sins, and everybody in the world can tell you, well, why did Jesus die? Well, for my sins. But they don't realize that He also went to hell for their sins. 
here it says we also have to believe in the burial. That he, his body went into the grave. And that he being God had the power to raise himself back up. Amen. Look, only God can forgive sins. Only God can raise the dead. And Jesus Christ did both of those things in his ministry and after the resurrection. Jesus has power of death and life. And now for the sake of the gospel, he's given us power through the Holy Spirit. Go back to Luke chapter 4. You can lose your place there and go back to Luke chapter number 4. We'll just read verse number 18 again. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Now this is the phrase I really want to focus in on tonight. And we're actually, we're going to define this in just a minute. We're going to go back to what Jesus is quoting to define this phrase. So we're going to skip over it for just a second. But I believe everything in this verse encapsulates this concept. Right? It all works around healing the brokenhearted. Look, there are a bunch of lost people in the world. We need to go preach the gospel to the poor to help heal their heart. Right? There's also other steps in this verse that will help heal the brokenhearted of your brothers and sisters. And this is a responsibility of a Christian. Look, he says, to preach deliverance to the captives. Deliverance. Look, there are born-again, Bible-believing Christians that are just in bondage, some to their own sins, some to their family or their spouse. And we need to remind them through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the Word of God, that they can have deliverance through the problems that are in their life. He says, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Now this phrase here, recovering of sight to the blind. Now Jesus did just that miracle. They were blind, He made them see. But I believe the application for us is a spiritual application. There are people that if they're not saved, they're totally blind, right? They're in, tar- in darkness now. There are Christians that are blind because they don't have the vision of God. In Proverbs 29, it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Look, we don't keep the law to get saved. Once you are saved, get the vision of the Bible. You need to obey what he said. If you do, you will be blessed and it will set you free. It will help you recover your sight. I believe there are many Christians in America, they're truly saved. They have faith as the grain of a mustard seed. And yet if we looked at their life or their lifestyle, we might question their salvation, right? Jesus said we judge unrighteous judgments because we judge by appearance, right? Only God can see the heart. But I believe there are many Christians in America that need this revival in their heart of, of recovering their sight. There are blind Christians. They don't know what God's will is for their life. They don't understand the milk of the Word because they're not reading it. They don't have someone through the power of the Holy Spirit that's preaching to them. And they need to recover these things. They need to build these things back up in their life. He says here in the last part of that verse, he says, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And you can lose your place in Luke chapter 4. Go to James chapter 1. Now the Bible reads that uh, now that Lord, I'm sorry, now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Right? Where God's Spirit is in God's people, and they are gathered together, there is true freedom. Listen, you know, the politics of today are so messed up. They have to add hundreds, if not thousands of laws every single year because people are acting crazy and there's all these new things the government wants to come down on us. And yet, if there were more Christians, we would have more freedom. If there were more Christians that knew the Word of God and they were filled with the Spirit of God and they obeyed God, we wouldn't need all the laws that we have in America. Boy, would today, you know, the, the, the America could get back to that sort of thing, that sort of revival. And some think it could happen. Some say, well, no, no, not until the Lord returns. And hey, I don't know. You be the judge of that. You know, it's, it's up to your theory. But I believe it's my responsibility through the power of the Spirit of God I'm anointed with to preach liberty and to tell people that God has a vision for their life. It's in His Word. It's in the Bible. We need to give that to them. It will set them free. It will recover their sight. It will set at liberty 
them that are bruised. You know, liberty is a, it's, is a word that's often thrown around and most people don't even know what it really means. I mean, it basically means freedom, right? No restrictions. But again, where it says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You know, there are churches that go by the name Liberty, and it's a do whatever you want. Come however you want and leave the same. And we don't really care what Bible you use. We don't care what lifestyle you are in. We're not going to preach against your sin. We're not going to tell you that God ever said anything was wrong. Just do whatever you want. Look, that's not true liberty. That's not the Spirit of the Lord. True liberty comes from understanding the Word of God. You're in James chapter 1. I want you to find verse number 22. This is very important. James chapter 1, verse number 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So he's saying, we need to do what his word says, not just hearers. Now understand, first of all, the book of James is at the end of the Bible, right? It's all the way here in the back. All of this stuff was written for our example or how to be saved. So by the time you get to James back here, this is for a Christian in the church how they ought to be living. How you ought to function now that you have the Holy Spirit in you. What type of a person ought you to be? So when he says, be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. I want you to think about this. Doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. In other words, you have to do what you read. If you will do what the Bible says, it will heal your own broken heart. If you will just spend the time and read the Bible, God will give you His Word that through the Spirit you can give to someone else and heal their broken heart. The blind world needs to know that God saved them and that you know, they need to obey the Gospel. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at the next verse here. Verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Right? So he's talking about a person looking in a mirror, but he says, if any just hear the word and not a doer. Right? And I believe he's even taking a step farther. I believe this is somebody that's not even reading the Bible. Right? It doesn't say whoever hears the word, reads the word, it says who hears the word. Right? Where do you hear the word? In church? Right? When the pastor gets up here and he tells you things you need to apply in your life, when he tells you what you need to do according to God's Word, you need to obey. Yep. Right? Well, I listen to that radio program with Pastor so-and-so. Well, are you doing what he says? Or are you just nodding along and saying, yep, I, listen. I had church today, I listened to the radio. Are you listening to some internet pastor and say, boy, he's really fired up. He's got, he said this, he said that. Yeah, but are you doing what God said to do? Because if not, you're deceiving yourself. Right, So he says it's like you're looking in a mirror. Look at verse 24. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Right? Men, you go look in the mirror, there's food on your shirt, and then you just keep on going. Right? And your wife will catch you. Now, look, he's saying it's like when you... Hear the word, but don't apply what it says. You don't obey what God has said to you. It's like you take a look in the mirror and you just shrug it off and you keep on trucking. That's, that's not right. He's saying you're actually deceiving yourself. You're hurting yourself when you do that. God's will is that we would be a doer. When you see a problem, you apply it. And too many Christians, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not the preacher. I'm not a leader. I'm not even the song leader. It's okay. God knows my situation. He knows my heart. Yeah, and he wrote, a, he wrote a letter to you. He gave you the Word of God, and you need to apply it to your life. Amen. And if you don't, you're being disobedient. If you don't, you're deceiving yourself. Look at verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, that's the Bible, and continue it therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Do you want to be blessed of God? Then don't just hear God's Word preached. You need to look into the law of liberty. You need to open up the Bible for yourself and read what it says and ask God for His Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you into the truth and that no man should have to teach you that He will be your instructor. 
Right? This is his goal for your life. And too many people, they'd just rather hear. They're hearers only, but they don't actually read it. They don't actually do it. He says, but a, notice how he shifts gears. Because first he said, a doer of the word. And now in this verse, he says, a doer of the work. Hey, praise God, we are not saved by works. You don't have to do one good work to get to go to heaven. You only have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And now that you're saved by faith alone, God wants you to get to work. God wants you to do some work. Yeah, but you don't understand. I'm too busy. I've got other things in life. Boy, you know, I'm getting old. Hey, I'm, hey today's my 40th birthday. Right? I'm standing on top of that hill and I'm saying, well, well, how far down does the hill go? Well, how fast is it going down the hill? Well, either way, I know where I'm going. It's to the kingdom of God. And I look forward to that. So if I know that my destination is the kingdom of God, let's keep that in my vision. Let's be a doer of the work while there is still time. Let's work while there's light. You know, he says at the end there, he says, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If you read the Bible and you do what it says, you will be blessed of God. This is his promise. This is his promise. God cannot lie. It says in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God has promised you some things. It's in the Bible. You see it. You apply it. You do it. You will be blessed of God. Now, if I took, so, raise your hands, who wants to be blessed of God? I'm pretty sure everybody would raise their hand. Right? Unless you, you can't. Unless you got a, a youngin in your arms and you can't raise your hand or something, right? But, you know, often while I'm out preaching the gospel to folks, if they get saved, one of the last verses I will leave them with is Revelation chapter 1. It says, blessed is he that readeth, right? Looking into the perfect law of liberty. He says, and, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, right? We need to hear preaching also. We need to hear instruction. We need to come to church and sit in the pew and let God instruct you through the Holy Spirit in the man of God. So there's a blessing in reading. There's a blessing in hearing the preaching, the prophesying. And he says, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Yes. You understand, you don't know if you have even tomorrow. None of us are promised even tomorrow. So today, we need to keep those things which are written therein. We need to be a doer of the work. And we will be blessed in our deeds. This is God's promise. Yeah. And listen, you want to heal your broken heart? Read the Bible. Do what it says, and God will bless you. This is His promise. It's very simple. Flip ahead to chapter number 2. James chapter number 2. Look at verse number 8. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. Right, So we're blessed for doing the Word. And how do we help heal others? How do we heal the brokenhearted? The Bible calls it the royal law. Do unto your neighbor. right? Do unto your brother. Love your brother like yourself and God will bless you. Look at verse 9. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Well, but you know, I have my favorite person over here. They're always dressed just right, and they smell just right, and they look just fine. And then there's that guy over there. I don't know what's going on in his life, but I don't like how he smells. I don't look how, like, like how he looks. I don't like how he talks. Why should I help him out? Why should I care about him? Why should I pray for him? I don't even know him. The Bible says you're being a respecter of persons. Well, I like this one because of appearance, and I don't like this one because of some selfish, fleshly reason. The Bible says you're a transgressor of the law. Well, I like the good looking folks, but boy, those, boy, those strange looking ones, those strange acting ones, they need more prayer. They need more prayer than the other guy that seems to have everything together, wouldn't you think? Because look, there are times that we're all one or the other. It seems like we have it together, maybe we don't. Or maybe we, it's just obvious to everyone, you don't have it together. As Christians, the royal law is to love and help others, and that's what we ought to do. We need to love our neighbor even if we can find a physical reason not to. Look at verse number 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. That's right. I haven't murdered. I haven't killed. I haven't 
fornicated. I haven't committed adultery. I've never got drunk. I've never smoked or drank or cussed. You ever lied? Uh, <laughs> right? What's the Bible say? He that maketh a lie. If you've ever lied one time, you are a liar. You have offended God's law. Romans 3 says, As it is written, there are none righteous, no, not one. But I'm not as bad as those people. Hey, don't compare yourselves amongst others. right? That's not wise. But look, compare yourself to the Word of God. Look in the mirror of the law of liberty and say, hey, even though I'm not a murderer, i got a lot of stuff to get together. We need to judge ourselves. So he says, he, if he, he, whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offended one point, he is guilty of all. They need a Savior just as much as you. Look at verse 11. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Look at this key verse. So speak ye, and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Go to Isaiah chapter 61. So speak ye, so speak to your neighbor in love as you ought to, and so do, that's a doer of the work, as Christians that will be judged by this perfect law of liberty, the Word of God. You understand? You need to live right now like you are being judged right now by God and He will bless you now. We'll be rewarded one day. We look forward to that. Right? But in the immediate, God hates hypocrites. He hates loser Christians that don't do what they, what they know they should do. And He's saying we need to speak and do as individuals that will be judged by the Bible. If we consider that now, if we, if we allow God's Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us now by looking at the Word of God, writing them on our heart, then when you cross paths with sin or decisions where the devil's trying to get you out of the fight, it's an easier decision to make because you know that God will judge you. And He will judge or bless you in this life. That's very important. So Luke chapter 4, he had said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the Gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised. So we're talking about liberty tonight and healing the brokenhearted. How can we heal the brokenhearted and set people free? Set them at liberty. You're in Isaiah 61. This is what Jesus was quoting. It said he, was, he opened the book and this is what He was reading. Look at verse number 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings. There's the Gospel. Unto the meek. Right? In the New Testament it said the poor. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Right? That's to heal. You know, if, if you had a, a vase or something that had broken and you bind it up and put it back together, right? I imagine somebody's broken heart and then here you come with the Word of God to help put it back together. Yeah. This is something that God wants us as, as Christians to be able to do and that has been forgotten. That has been ignored. Usually it says, well, I changed my status on Facebook. Everybody knows I'm a Christian. I go to church. My neighbors see me walk out with a tie every Sunday and Wednesday so clearly I've done my job. No, you haven't. It's not what it's about. It's about helping the hearts. He says to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. We're going to set some people free out of the prison. First and foremost, I believe as Christians, we ought to be preaching the gospel to those that are around us that are lost. But there's still the application of your brother of helping your brother in a time of need. Yeah, but you, my, brother, my brother doesn't believe like I do. Boy, he's not as conservative as I am. He doesn't dress like me. He doesn't look at the same... I mean, it's, it's a whole other lifestyle. Yeah, is he saved? Help him. Help him. Heal his broken heart. Bring him back to the Word of God. Teach him. Proclaim to him liberty through the power of the anointed Holy Spirit that's been given to you. This is our responsibility. Look at verse number 2 here. He says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now Jesus had stopped here when he read that. We're going to continue. He says, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. I've heard varying opinions on this verse and why Jesus stopped. And there certainly is an application here in Isaiah 61 of future things that will yet to happen. But we're just going to make an uh, immediate application for healing the broken hearts. 
And here, to, to proclaim the acceptable day of the Lord, Jesus, I believe, was saying, prophecy is fulfilled. The Messiah is come. The Lamb of God has come to take away the sins of the world. And guess what else? There is judgment coming. He says, the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort all that mourn. Hey, salvation is just that. You know, you have to understand you're a sinner, that there is judgment. God will avenge one day. And there is comfort also in the gospel. Right? So healing the brokenhearted, I, the, like the spearhead of healing comes with preaching, comes with the power of the Holy Spirit preaching through you. In Psalm 147, he says, He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up the wounds. But yet then here he transitions into this day of vengeance of our God. In 2 Thessalonians, he, you know, he says that the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Right? There's things coming. He says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming in fire to judge those that don't obey the gospel. You have to believe it. When you hear it, you have to believe it. If you don't, that's disobedience. You understand? So when he says obey, wait, is that by keeping the law? Hey, how about have no other gods before me? How's that law for salvation? Right? How about believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? That's a commandment. And if you reject that, you're not obeying the gospel. You will be judged. In flaming fire, taking vengeance. He says, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. He's saying not only is this judgment coming, but it will last forever. Hell is real. It is hot. And knowing the terror of the Lord, therefore we persuade men. Knowing that God will avenge and He will judge and that people will end up in hell, we persuade men. Heaven or hell is a choice. It's an individual choice. And you may have the opportunity to help somebody make that choice. I want to heal the brokenhearted and encourage you to arm yourself with the gospel to be able to give that decision to somebody. Like this guy Stephen. He now knows. Right? The work's not done yet. The decision's not made yet. But he now has the knowledge he has to make a decision or he will end up in hell. How do we heal the brokenhearted? We preach the gospel. Look at verse 3. He says, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. He's saying these people are depressed and you lift them up. These people are so, oh, we're just so down and we're mourning, we're in heaviness. He says, give them a spirit that will lift them up and encourage them. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. He says that they might be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that He might be glorified. Listen, what we do as Christians, number, goal number one is glorify God. It's to give Him praise and honor and glory. And we can do that. One of the ways is to be able to preach the gospel to the poor. One of the other ways we can do that is to heal the brokenhearted. Find somebody that's mourning and encourage them and lift them up. Bind up those problems they have. Teach them there's victory in the power of God. That's a responsibility of Christians. But he calls them trees of righteousness. Now the trees are representative of people. We are all trees and we all bear certain types of fruit. Right? In Matthew, or in Proverbs 11 it says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Hey, you can become a tree of life once you have everlasting life. You can have fruit come off of you when you preach the gospel to other people and win souls to Christ. In Matthew 13, Jesus used the analogy. He said, but he that receiveth seed, that's the word of God. We plant seeds, right? That's the word of God. He says, he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit. And bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. What's that saying? Do you understand there are people that you can preach the gospel to, you can give them the word of God, that seed will not only take root, they'll become a tree of life, they'll be saved, and then they'll bear fruit. They will get other people saved. Thirty people saved? Sixty other people saved? A hundred other people saved? 
This is the goal of becoming a tree of righteousness. It's to reproduce yourself. Jesus told His disciples, Go thou and do likewise. And they did. And it says disciples were multiplied. As Christians, that's what we need to do. We need some spiritual multiplication. Psalm 126, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. If you have a heart for the lost, you find them the mourning, the downtrodden, you pray for them, you're weeping for them, you're going to God for them, and you go and you take the seed, the Word of God, and you go to them, and you heal that broken heart, and you preach the Gospel to them, you will come again with some fruit. You will come again with some more disciples. How do we heal the brokenhearted? How do we heal the brokenhearted? I believe we need to build up old churches. I believe this is very important. This is biblical. I believe one of the ways we can heal the brokenhearted is to help help build up broken down churches, broken down Christians, broken down individuals. Look at verse number 4 here. Isaiah 61, 4. And they shall build the old wastes. And they shall raise up the former desolations. And they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. Listen to me. God needs men willing to build up the waste cities, the waste places, the fallen down churches. It's time to repair. You want to know what revival is in America? It's people helping other Christians. It's people helping churches and building them up. I want you to go to Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26. We're almost done here. He says we need to build the old wastes. Well, you know, people drive up and down this highway out here. It says, the desolations of many generations. You understand there are people that have driven past this building for many years and said, yeah, that old building's just getting older. Yeah, I used to have a cousin that went to that church. My daddy used to go to that church. We used to go to that church. It's our job to get them back in church. It's our job to build up the waste places and encourage this community and get people on fire for God. As a Christian, how do you heal the brokenhearted? You help somebody else. As a Christian, how do you heal your own broken heart? Listen to me on this. You're hurting. You're not sure about life. You, everything's up in the air. You're not even sure if you're in the will of God or if God's still got something for you. Listen to me. Help other people and God will build you up. If you go find the people that need help, God will encourage you because you're encouraging them. In Proverbs it says that there's power of death and life in the tongue. Well, there goes that old guy. He used to come here. Forget about him. Right? Oh yeah, I don't know. But hey, stop destroying things with your tongue. That's what the devil loves to do. Well, if he could just whisper in your ear and get you to tear somebody down with their tongue. Did you see who showed up at church today? How about going and loving on them? Hugging them? Telling them, it's good to see you. How have you been? Can I come by and see? Can I encourage you? You guys should come on back. Let me take you to lunch. Listen, we need to appeal to the flesh sometimes to be able to get through to their spirit so that we can heal the brokenhearted. That's how God uses us sometimes. How do we, build, how do we heal the brokenhearted? We build up Christians. We all know other Christians in our life that are out of the fight. They used to do it. They gave up. They used to be right there with us, boy. They they was on fire. Now they're on their butt. Listen, as Christians, it's our responsibility to start loving them. Oh, but you don't know the kind of sin they're in. I don't care what kind of sin they're in. Did Jesus die for it? Can they be forgiven of it? Could they be restored of it? What are you doing to help them get out of that sin? You're anointed with the Holy Spirit. You can help them. Look, you're in Genesis chapter 26. Look at verse number 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year an hundredfold and the Lord blessed him. Right? Hey, there are trees that bring forth a hundredfold. The Lord greatly blessed him in this land. Would to God that we could increase Jacksonville, Florida with a hundred new disciples this year. It's possible. Are you praying for it? Don't write it off. Don't write God off. Look what he says, verse 13. And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. Notice, went forward. Oh yeah, but I'm getting older in life. I'm getting closer and closer to those pearly gates. Hey, 
If you're going to the kingdom, work for the kingdom now. Don't worry about your day of death. Are you building rewards then? Are you working for that vision? Have you kept the vision? Do you know that you're still in a race? That there is a finish line? There is a goal? And you can be in God's perfect will and do great things for God? I don't care how old you are. I don't care how broken down you are. I don't care how poor you are. God wants to use you. So here he keeps moving forward. Look at verse 14. For he had possession of flocks and possession of herds and great store of servants. And the Philistines envied him. You notice how the world always covets your peace? How can you go through all that and still have peace of mind? Well, I have the peace that passeth understanding. I have the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in my heart. And listen, we all get excited and emotional at times when bad things happen, but it's only God that can bring us back to, well, you know what? He's still on the throne. Do you mean that? Do you believe that? Do you say that? They envied him here, he says. In verse 15, he goes on, he says, For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with dirt. Listen to me. America, we have had some major righteous victories in the past generations. And if you look at the newspaper today, if you, look at, if you watch the news today, you're going to say, what in the world is going on? Could you imagine if Christians from 50 years ago or even 100 years ago, if they were told what would be happening? Well, they'd say, oh, it must be the end times. Think about it. Oh, you know, the, the abortion is, is so commonplace. Not only do we kill thousands of babies a day here in America, we're funding abortions in other countries around the world. Your tax money is killing babies. It's wicked as hell. What in the world is going on with our country? I thought we were established with religious liberty. The freedom to worship God and preach the gospel. I thought America was known for that. Listen, we're in trouble today. We're in trouble. The Philistines have stopped our wells. They have filled our wells with dirt. Those victories of the past generations, we can't count on them anymore. We have to fix them. I mean, you look, queer pride. Divorce is easier than ever. Children are being raised fatherless and they end up, they end up in prison more, more than, than, times than not when, when you look at the poor children. There's fake churches everywhere. Yep. There's broken hearted people all across this nation. Yep. And they've heard about Jesus, but they don't have that peace yet. They need to hear it. There are Christians that are broken hearted that have just given up. You just don't know. This has been a long ride. I'm ready to just put it in coast. Maybe it's time to put it back and drive. That's right. Listen to me. Look, look at verse number 16 here. And, and Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. Look, the world knows we're stronger. We have the power of God. right? And sometimes God uses separation as His instrument to go and repair the old cities. He was doing well there. But hey, there was a set. Go from us. Get out of here. Okay, well, there's some repair that needs to happen. Look at this. Look at the next verse. Verse 17. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley Gerer and dwelt there. And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham and he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. He didn't give up. He said, yeah, I'm going to go conquer that mountain again. I'm going to go dig that well again. We're going to go build that city again. We're going to rebuild that church. We're going to go to that Christian that's been out of the fight for a decade and we're going to get him back on fire for God. Amen. Think about the application of this. We need to build up people. One-on-one, -on -one, individuals. We need to reestablish the victories. You know, every year, well, well got to vote for Republican so-and-so. He might just fix abortion. Well, I don't believe they're ever going to fix abortion, to be honest with you. They've been talking about it forever. And that when they had the power, they didn't do anything about it. Don't be a, a one-issue person. If you are, make your one issue the Word of God. Look, if you get your nose in this, instead of the newspaper, instead of the political column, you will be more successful at changing this country than by how you vote. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Are you lifting him up? Are you studying your Word? Yes. Are you able to give it to somebody else? Yes. You need to go and lift it up and tell people what he has said That's to heal good. the brokenhearted. Yeah. We have to preach the gospel. That's good. Look at verse 19. We're almost done. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. 
And the herdmen of Ger did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. Well, I thought we just conquered that. And now they're saying it's theirs? What do you mean the new King James is just as good as the King James? right? What do you mean the ESV? Did you guys hear about that? The ESV, it was last year or the year before. They said, this is our final translation. We found a new script under a rock and we felt that we should change it this way or that way. So we are going to patent it and never change it again. Then they went back. Don't worry, we'll change it again in five years. Look, the, the Word of God has been perverted today. This is the seed. This is how people get saved. And that's what the devil wants to attack. You know how many just downtrodden, broken-hearted people I've seen in bookstores? Well, I don't know which, which Bible is a good one. Hey, let me tell you. I'll run the employee off and tell them, hey, get one of these. You want some success in life? Don't get that, that, that silly Bible, the NIV, the ESV, the extremely silly version. They strove with him. They called the water ours. Right? That's what they're doing. The Word of God. Well, we got the Bible too. No, you don't. Look at this, verse 21. And they digged another well and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. And he removed from thence and digged another well. And for that they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth. And he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. They kept going. They're building up. They're, they're rebuilding the wells. They're rebuilding cities. They're rebuilding people. And you keep going. You keep going. Let me tell you something. I believe there's an application in this story here. You get on fire. You start soul winning. You start preaching the gospel to those old Christians that are messed up. And you get them back in church. You start helping people and building people up. You're going to hit a brick wall sometimes. And they're going to strive with you. And they're going to say, no, go away. You have a little bit of success. And, oh, that's our water. Leave us alone. But you just keep going. You keep going. And you will find room that God has designed for you where you can be successful, where you can be fruitful, where you can multiply. Look at the next verse, 23. And he went up from thence to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared unto him in the same night and said, I am the Lord, I'm sorry, I am God of Abraham thy father. Listen, fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. How do we heal the brokenhearted? We build up individuals. We disciple other Christians. We get the unsaved saved. Let's build up the waste places. Let's build up the waste cities. Yeah, but that's been a desolation for generations. That's okay. God's bigger. Yeah, but they might strive with us and run us off and say that's their water. That's okay. God will make room. Just do what you've been commanded to do. He's told us to heal the brokenhearted. There are many men of God throughout the Bible. right? It says those things were written for our example so we can learn. The stories of the Old Testament aren't just cool stories. There is great doctrine in these stories. You think about Elijah. Great victories. Surrounded. Lord, they've broken down the altars. They've killed all the prophets. I and I alone. Right? What's God say? Hey, there are 7,000 men that have not yet bowed their knee to Baal. Sometimes we get wore out and frustrated. And God, hey, God will encourage you. Other Christians will encourage you. You think about how Peter, when he was in the prison, he thought he was done. There's no way out of this. But it says that the people were praying for him without ceasing. And the next thing you know, an angel shows up. The doors open. The shackles fall off. The guards are, well, that's a miracle. Yeah, it was. In fact, they didn't even believe it when he showed up. The maiden didn't, well, I can't be Peter. We know that he's about to die. No, they were praying. Are you praying for the brokenhearted? Are you trying to encourage other Christians? No. You think about John the Baptist. John the Baptist is one of the most awesome characters in the Bible. A lot of power, a lot of humility. You know, for years I, I have prayed for uh, wisdom and humility. I mean, two decades or more, I've been praying. I try to add that in my, my daily prayer. Lord, I need your wisdom and I need humility. But I've discovered that there is wisdom in humility. If you will humble yourself, God will lift you up. You think about John the Baptist. He did some mighty things for God. He rebuilt the waste places. Right? His message was, prepare ye the way. Right? The Lord Jesus Christ is coming. He needs disciples. He needs people that are ready to go. He was invigorating them. He was reviving them. He was stirring them up through the power of the preaching, through the Holy Spirit. But how did John's life end? 
John was the brokenhearted. John was in prison, right? Herod was going to put him to death. He sends his disciples to Jesus. Art thou the one, or should we seek for another? Boy, that's got to be discouraging. But what did Jesus tell the disciples? He said, Go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard. How that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised. To the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Not only did Jesus say, hey, I am the one. He said, I fulfilled this prophecy and that prophecy. I'm helping people. I'm rebuilding people. I'm doing all the things that he said he would do. I'm doing everything that was prophesied in Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. How do we heal the brokenhearted? We preach. We set them at liberty. We heal the land. We heal the churches. We heal individuals. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, thank You for Your Word. Lord, thank You for this awesome passage about the fulfillment of prophecy that You've done, Lord. I pray that You would help us to make an application in our own life and recognize that if we will follow You and help others, You will encourage us. You will revive us. You will heal our broken heart as we go out to heal others. Lord, I pray that You would continue to bless this church and just pour Your Spirit out on the pastor. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.